Chapter 16 Aria wanted to withdraw the statement, but it had passed. She quaked to open, thinking it was Kana, only to see the house nanny. She had brought her no bed sheets from Angel. She also told her that rumor had saturated that Sugar had fled to the hills and might have met Elgon. Aria did not see the night ending. She wanted to go there that night and tear her into pieces. She never wanted any girl to be near to Elgon. The following morning, she told the guards that she had gone to look for sugar. She walked as if there was no tomorrow, through the very thick forest to the rocks. As soon as she reached the first gate, a warning arrow passed near her neck and landed behind her. She stopped and cried the monster's name. When she made another step forward, another weak arrow hit her foot. She knew the man was serious. He was highly mad at her. Felgoni had been humiliated before the woman he loved. He was even feeling shy. Arya spoke. I am sorry for what happened to you. I wanted to stop him from hitting you, but I did not want Maudi to think otherwise. Please, let me talk to you. There is something I want to tell you. She walked three steps in front and thought he had listened only to see three arrows pointing into her. She sat down and sobbed like a kid, asking herself why Elgon treated her like a stranger. She got her scarf and blindfolded herself, then walked towards the house. Elgon knew she had beaten him. She ultimately, she unintentionally walked to a wrong direction to which she was about to knock a tree. This pulled Elgon out. He never wanted anything to happen to her. Right behind her, he walked. She smiled, having heard him coming. She continued moving confidently, for she knew her guardian angel was around. Fortunately, she passed by the tree and continued. He too was feeling good as he watched her walk minus anyone intervening. He was dying with the feelings. He really loved her. She wanted to see him and removed the scarf, then turned. He was not there. He had hidden behind the tree. She put it back and sharpened her ears. When she heard him coming, she turned and pulled it off, then checked behind the nearby tree. He was not there. He had climbed up. Aria knew Elgon could not let her stumble. She looked around and saw a cliff and folded again. Then he walked towards it. Right, she had guessed. He felt someone touching her shoulder and pretended not to have felt. She knew he would hide, thus intentionally fell. In the air, he swung, feeling the warmth of his hands. He had her as expected. What a scene. He carried her for a distance estimated to be 800 meters without getting tired. No wonder. Aria called him a monster. He asked him. She asked him whether he was human. As usual, he never replied. She did not know how to get words from him. She pulled off the scarf and looked into his eyes. The mind seemed to be far. He finally took her to a small modern house in the forest and welcomed her inside. It was looking nice inside. Elgon got her a chair, on which she sat and served her tea. He was so amazing. She had never seen a man doing such things. She grew up knowing that it was woman's role. When he sat facing her, Aria felt shy and stood up and went behind him, then checked on his wound in the head. On the head. 
it was not as big as expected. He got her by the hand and then pulled her to bend to his shoulder. Elboni could not withstand her burning warmth. He got off the chair and faced her. She was so beautiful. He spoke it. You are full of beauty. And her eyes were shining with love. He got her by the waist, then pulled her to his charged body and spoke. I will not let you go. I will climb the rivers, sail the mountains, jump over the seas just to find you. I will always be there. He got a brand new bracelet made of pure gold and put it on her left hand and said, It will be on your side always and pump on you every second like your heartbeat. When you see a black ribbon, I'll be around. Tears filled his eyes and decided to hug her. He knew she was getting married to another man, yet there was no way he could get her, for he was not allowed to participate in the dance to win her. That is why he hated some customs. He never even wished to participate in them. He did not want things that deprived of someone's free will. He took a deep breath, and began caressing Arya's back. Right, he was happy that she was with him in his secret house. Only Marie knew this place. The rest, including Zab, did not know. When she felt his touch, her mind moved back to the carnival day. She felt the same touch and closed her eyes. When she opened, his glasses were on the nearby table. She concentrated on his ears and inquired the eyes and inquired about the eyes. He pretended not to know. Aria got mad at once and began beating his chest. She knew he was the one who slept with her, but he was denying. She started crying as he seized her, she asked him whether she was at the carnival. Elgon said no. She called him a liar and pushed him, then ran out of the house. Chapter 17 Elgon let her go as he stood thinking why she had suddenly changed her mind. He caught a glance of the spectators and realized that she knew everything. He chased after her through the short shortcuts to stand in front of her. She was crying, she was crying bitterly. She did not want to listen to him. When he brought the hand to touch her, she pushed him and continued running. They raced around the area to the extreme end of the hill. Arya had lost her way. Explained that she could not go back without his knowledge, for he had set a, ma a maze up there. She warned him against drawing close to her as he lamented, Yes, I was there. I was in my final year. Aria, stop it, young mo you monster. Elgon, no one could believe. You called me illiterate. I embraced it. You made me your foil. Aria, all along you sought for revenge from my family. That is why you slept with me, right? Elgon, I didn't know it was you. Aria, how did you know that I was not a virgin on the right? Liar. Elgon, it was coincidence. I wanted I shame you the way you did to me. Aria, you are deceiving again. 
Aria attacked Elgon and began hitting him seriously. She beat him while crying, for Elgon was not only fooling but also confusing her. She slapped him until got tired. Her clothes were wetted with, with tears. Elgon finally held her and explained. He intoned. I had no idea of sleeping with anyone during the carnival, for I hated women for sure. When I saw a girl moving towards me smiling, I chose not to disappoint her in front of her friends. When she took me away, I discovered that she had the prettiest body in the world. Her breasts immediately turned me on, and when I touched her beads, oh, I lost control. She was the girl of my dreams. I knew my ancestors had not betrayed me. They had compensated me with a divine flower. Slowly I saw my hands lowering until fingers touched her attractive thighs. When I looked at her, she was enjoying every second with me as if she knew me. I was the most enthusiastic. What beat my understanding was that she warned me against telling Maudi, a person I did not know. I realized that the girl mistook me for someone else and when she took off my mask, I was lost. I got lost and left the party. I never forgave myself. It haunted me day and night. I wanted to find that girl for an apology, but it was two days past the party. My friends comforted me that it was normal for girls to sleep with the boys on that day. I always dreamt of that girl. The more I failed to get her, the further I loved her. She changed me. After her, I stopped hating women, though people still thought I did. She turned me into a man as I made her a woman. During the last rite, I wanted to sprinkle blood on your person at the time when you, your seal is broken. But I realized that you were not innocent. When I heard the screams of guilt, the way you sang was the same as the girl I slept with. And when the mind brought it that you had a friend called Maudi, I skillfully spread blood on the bedsheet. I changed my mind on the spot. I am sorry for that. And never forgive me. I began thinking that I might have slept with you, but I could not ask anyone. That is why I really... I released the other statement to see your reaction. However, I was not convinced. I decided myself to protecting you. I decided myself to protect you as a compensation for that. Although things worsened when I gained strange thoughts about you to an extent of seeing you in the dreams. I fight it, but it seems it is beyond my making. Aria. I. She did not wait for him to complete when she shaded him with a thunderous slap. Aria asked him to answer whether she was his toy to play with at any time. She ordered him to show her the way and forget about her forever. She was so mad at him. They walked to the main road amidst endless pleading for a chance for consideration. The girl never wanted to know. As they reached where Arya knew, she barked at him to stop following her. Since he was the person she wished not to see again, Elgon wanted her to listen, but Arya started abusing Elgon while shouting on top of her voice that he was a monster full of vengeance. 
Elgon also shouted at her, I love you. Arya, the monster loves you. When Arya turned to hear it again, she saw Sugar walking towards them. She had heard everything loud and clear. Chapter 18. Straight to the point, she reached with a question whether the two knew each other before. Sugar acknowledged Maud and Kana's statements that the violence Arya used against Elgon was beyond normal. She clapped twice while nodding, then lamented that all the times Arya went missing had connection to Elgon the monster. Arya stopped talking at Sugar. At Sugar's side, she was still angry with her. Sugar stood near Elgon while touching his shoulder, then appreciated him for the wonderful night between the two. Her eyes were flashing into Arya's wanting to know her reaction. Well, she was still annoyed with the two for different reasons. Sugar lowered the eyes to Arya's skirt that contained the mud, then stepped aside and turned to Elgon, who had more on the trousers, then exclaimed. She wondered how foes began to share mud and inquired whether they had jumped. Sugar smelt on Elgon's clothes that carried Arya's perfume, then turned it to Arya. Arya stopped, pressed and pulled Sugar's nose, then deposited a nice slap onto her cheek and sloped down hills. While Sugar was yearning for help, Arya came back and dragged her to the palace. They went quarreling as Sugar bargained that it would be better if each kept the other's secret safe. Elgon was there, rewinding how the gods had made him taste the sweetness of heaven and withdrew it before he enjoyed it to the fullest. He still did not know how he got the courage to speak with, to speak what he said to her. He was afraid a bit, he, for he thought he spoke the right words at a wrong time. He smiled. He smiled and recalled. He smiled and recalled the way he hugged her. He shouted her name from the top of the hill so loud that those down, including Arya, heard. He jumped over the rocks, then climbed as many trees as possible. He was so happy. At least he had some good hours with her and spoke the most important thing. He went and closed the main house where Sugar slept and went back home. They had missed him. He was, he was sure Marie had a lot of stuff to tell him. Reaching, it was the opposite. At the mat, Zab pointed. He knew she was tense. This was their interrogation site. He had to explain about the previous day's fight, which he had then turned to Arya. He was stuck. Marie laughed at him. Zab warned him about his Fuge family, and if he had no one to talk to, it was better to go to his uncle's home in the city. Zab preferred living a peaceful life without anyone's intervention. Elgon apologized to the family for attra attracting the Zivuge family home. He promised never to engage in any battles with anyone and swore to avoid the acidic girl, Arya. He remained seated at home. He would say sorry and stay there. Medi One would say sorry and stay there meditating for some good hours. The moment he stood up, he pulled Marie to the watchtower that he was still constructing on the tree branches. He stood. 
she told him about Arya's visitation, then her blunder of calling him in front of the guards. She added that Arya had seen everything in the album. While he was still coiling, Marie asked him to be frank whether he loved Arya. Marie did not know that the brother had spoiled everything. He narrated the whole story from A up to Z. Instead of feeling pity, Marie calmly sloped down and ran around the courtyard while jubilating that it was done. She was so excited. She climbed where he was and pulled him down. She jumped on his back and clung there as he carried her to the road. They were happy together. The two got pots and went to the well jazzing. Children were backbiting them, and some who saw them paved way. Most of their parents had warned them against Elgoni's family. They called them black magicians. Rumor had worked that Elgon had lost to Angel when they were fighting for girls. The two began feeling their pots as boys whispered that one of the girls had come. It was true. Maudi had escorted Cardinal's younger brother Bishop in Chima. They were neighbors who had attended to the same college. Bishop was tall enough to earn respect and was cool and handsome. He had inner feelings for Maudi, although he had not gathered enough energy to tell her. Bishop squatted at the poles next to Marie and stole a glamorous look at her as he filled the pot. When Marie turned to see Bishop, the young man felt magnetic, felt magnetic fields pulling him towards her. He drowned in water. Bishop had never seen such beauty. The children shouted that what their parents said was true. They witnessed it. Some of them ran spreading the rumor that Marie had used witchcraft on Bishop. There, Elgon gave him a hand and pulled him out like a straw. Bishop tested how strong Elgon was. He, fa he formally introduced himself to Elgon, then showed him Maudi, his friend, as he commented that he really knew he was Elgon. He guessed that the source of trouble was Marie. Bishop was a free person, so liberal and social that Elgon liked his communication skills. Maudi was very silent when he let Bishop and Elgon walk the talk. They discussed about a number of things as Bishop advised him to join the tribal brigade and participate in the forthcoming sports gala. Bishop promised to talk to the organizing committee to let him participate. He whispered to Elgon that he was to win, every, to win very many titles using his skills. He turned to Marie and asked for her skills. She simply smiled. Marie was more of a politician, good at talking than hustling. She was like Maudi. Bishop notified Elgon to start training for near for men as if Angel and Cardinal were spending sleepless nights. As, as if Angel and Cardinal were spending sleepless nights doing their best. Bishop notified Elgon to start training for men for men as Angel and Cardinal were spending sleepless nights doing their best. He added that Angel had gained more experience in wrestling and he might find no heal in defeating Cardinal. He summed up that no one knew he would join, thus asked him to keep private. Bishop was so happy to meet Elgon 
as he intoned that he was a good man who deserved to serve his people and silence, silence the rumors about his family. He added that people knew how strong and important Elgon's family was. Thus, if he stood for them, everything would be on their side. Elgon thanked Bishop and asked him to visit him whenever he wanted. They had reached the junction. Maudi, who had been discussing with Marie about the boys, had to say goodbye. She stole a glance at Elgon and shied away. She wanted to talk to him, but did not want Bishop to know. After saying goodbye to each other, they parted and walked a few steps away. She turned and called him, Elgo. He too stopped walking, but never turned. She asked him whether she had talked to Arya. The moment she intoned Arya's name, he turned immediately and faced her. She walked towards him and whispered that she was so sorry about what Angel did to him. She also said that she missed him. Truly, her eyes showed it. Elgon saw it, while the rest sensed it. She picked his hand and folded his fingers, then wished he, him good night as an old man's voice called and warned Maudi that what she was doing was abominable. It was Elder Maiga. Trouble had come. Chapter 19. Elder Maiga moved forward and saw Elgon with Maudi, then warned them against breaking rules, for they were showing a bad example to the young ones. He summoned them to the court on the ninth day of the Black Star to receive their punishment. Maudi knew the consequences. She did not wait for Maiga to leave as she knelt down for an apology. He said that forgiving her was cheap, but not Elgon, for the council longed for, he, for this. Even the kids knew how Elgon blackmailed the elders and made them bow down for him like cowards. Maiga was not happy with him, but Eli was the most concerned. This did not leave Bishop behind. He joined Maudi. He explained to Maiga that if his girlfriend was convicted. She would have, she would not have a decent marriage with him in the near future. Marie also knelt and asked for sympathy. However, Maiga dismissed her. He called her a witch. He had heard the say on his way home about the whale saga. Maiga asked Elgon to kneel before him, a thing he did. He deliberately refused to do. He spoke that whoever stood his way would vanish like his ancestors. He added that Elgon's had come to stay, revive their glory, and put right what had gone wrong in Saza. He got Marie's hand and carried their pots. He promised to his sister that he was digging a well in their land the following day. Maiga stood in fear of Elgon's words. He sought to make him suffer. However, there was no way he could push the case that included Maudi, one of the wisest girls in Saza. She was so inspirational to the females and in addition, he had heard Bishop's words clearly and disclose and chose to let go. He promised to get Elgon another day. The elder moved slowly to his palace, leaving the two continue to their homes. It was already dark. Elgon did not sleep. He got out of the house and started digging a pond while thinking about Bishop and Maudi. He knew if he did not work hard, he would not get a woman to marry, for he knew Arya was attached to Angel. When he thought of her, he grew feeble and sat down. She had chased him openly. By 3 a.m., springs 
had started giving him water. It was done. He completed it before dawn, then he embarked on the watch over tower. He nailed it until breakfast. Zabu was the happiest to see his son focusing on the things he was meant to do. It did not take long for neighbors who had isolated them to draw water from the new well. They started slowly as word spread to the rest of Saza that 100 men had constructed a well in, of substandard water in eight days, but one man had dug a well of clean water in one night. It was no doubt that many called this sorcery. Elgon did not rest. He could run in the night, jump over Eli's fence, and tie a ribbon on Arya's window. Then watch her sleep and get back to work. He expanded the pathways into big roads. Then he constructed a bridge joining Saza to Taro tribe, which was highly civilized and developed. A few educated youths piqued interest in him slowly and began working together. They called traders from Taro to stage weekly bazaars to different places in Saza. Many people from other tribes visited his home to tour and emulate from him. Utensil stands and modern latrines that promoted sanitation lifted his name to great heights that even enemy families did the same. Eligon talked to a few educated girls from the east of Saza and established primary schools there, since the three that existed based in the center. These started from people's homes as he attracted those in the west where his home was to ask for the first secondary school in Saza. It remained a proposal to reckon. He did not stop watching Arya sleeping. He tied another black ribbon and knelt down in tears. They had piled up on the window. Aria could not take them. He thought she never saw them and transferred them to the nearby mango tree, then took off. He lived in a grief although community work kept him busy. He would al also train for the sports, though there was no guarantee that he would be allowed. The following morning, Bishop, Bishop showed up wearing a promising smile. He found Elgon making bricks in style. He had made a mold that released five bricks at once. This was so amazing. Bishop called him a wizard. They started laughing as Elgon talked about a secondary school. Laughter continued. The two had become great friends. They would at times walk around and see how their projects worked. This time Bishop unveiled the good news to him that the sports committee had finally accepted his application although he was to participate in a few activities since he was not he had not gone through the first stages of some games. Elgon quaked the ground with laughter. He was so happy. He could not believe what he had. Right, it was a reality. They slaughtered a goat that evening, which was roasted in the middle of the courtyard. People started coming slowly with goats of beer. Others lifted calabashes as the party went crazy. The old men who attended were the happiest. They appreciated the younger man for bringing those moving cities. One spoke that he had revived the family honor. Bishop was with friends from the south, jazzing on how they would win the titles from Cardinal, from the Central Lads. Those from the city, Eli's area of jurisdiction, took most of the trophies. Angel, too, 
came from there and cardinal as well fought on the side since he worked from there the west of elgon had no one with a title for decades while the jazz intensified the famous Volkswagen packed along the road angel kana cardinal moved out holding big sticks they stood in front of the fireplace and ordered the party to stop angel warned the bishop that he was to regret for betraying their crew for elgon a mere scumbag cardinal hit one of the lads a stick as kana and angel surrounded elgon the arrow from the watch tower passed onto cardinal's hand that held a stick leaving a scratch all looked up at once as elgon jumped using the support from angel and kana's shoulders to kick cardinal down chapter 20 marie spoke from up that the cowards had been surrounded thus it made no sense to waste their energy on them she advised her camp to let them go and sort everything the following day angel went away unhappy he warned bishop that he was to dwindle with the bastards they drove away humiliated the party did not continue Elgon escorted the bishop and the colleagues to the south slowly. He was afraid of facing his brother, Cardinal, and Angel the following day. Elgon touched his shoulder and comforted him that no one would win over them if they gathered public support. The D-Day had come. The arena was full. Drums beat like never before. The entire Saza was downhill. Zab, the most feared woman in the West, was somewhere in the corner. Many had heard of her. Well, she sat in the pavilion with some other old women of the tribe. They discussed about the game of his son. And, well, she felt esteemed. When she scattered eyes properly, she saw Arya seated on the table of the judges. Sugar was there as well. Some three chairs remained empty. They were meant for gents. Two took up them and one remained. The owner had refused to take it up. He preferred to play. Eli asked Maudi to occupy it. The panel had five members. Jemba the announcer took one took over the ceremony he called upon the athletics of a hundred meters the athletes of a hundred meters to get ready as the anthems went it did not take long for the games to commence the day moved on well it was approaching 10 o'clock when arm wrestling kicked off bishop marched against his brother cardinal they moved it to the ring from where the table was put in the middle of the two. No one was allowed inside the wrestling circle. Men sweated that day. Upon entering the room, booing him started. Many called the Bishop a traitor who had sold his people to foreigners. When the defending champion, the monk entered, the ground grew crazy. The vovuzeras surrounded sounded like never. Girls called him the best. And women cheered him up. His head moved above shoulders. He was the most famous here. The bell rang for the march to kick off. On their marks, they rested the elbows, then fingers got to the battle. It was an interesting one before the spectators. They got exactly what they expected when Cardinal won. It went to the in-laws, Kana against Angel, to which Angel took it. 
They took a 10 minutes rest, then the bell for finals went. The two friends got in touch at the right time. They had their own internal misunderstandings but came together at the time when Elgon showed up. Cardinal recalled Angel winning a year unfairly and kept it at heart. The spectators drummed to the fullest for both had undoubtable support. Cardinal turned to the judges, a year in particular, a thing that angered Angel. Cardinal stared at Angel and got his hand then he stole an eye at Aria, then he pushed Angel down. He quaked that Cardinal used the filthy tactics to win. He quarreled that Cardinal used filthy tactics to win. He asked for a rematch, which he saw Elgon entering the ground and marveled. He lost the game. The male judge stood up to announce Cardinal Nchima as the winner amidst jubilation from the, coward, from the crowds. Cardinal stopped Jemba as he pointed at the monster. Elgon had just arrived at the arena. Having finished a meeting with the likely sponsors of the proposed secondary school, he came knowing that his archery match was there in the afternoon. He had no idea that Cardinal wanted him so badly. This forced the judges into a short meeting about Cardinal's suggestion. Aria refused it and said that Elgon was not on the list, so he did not qualify. Bishop went up to Elgon and moralized him that this title was not for Bishop and his supporters. Bishop went up to Elgon and moralized him that this title was for Bishop and his supporters, not Elgon. The elders discussed and resolved that if Elgon had asked for the match, it would not be granted. But since it was the champion risking his trophy to a monster, the match was commissioned to prevail. Aria continued to oppose it, but it was late. She had re redeveloped her hatred for Elgon more than ever before. Sugar looked at her and wondered. The bell went for Elgon to enter the ring. He went to the corner and pray prayed to the gods the way his ancestors did. Then he went and knelt before his mom, Zab, for blessings and told her that his trophy was hers. He moved to the center, bowed before the elders, then he greeted the judges one by one. Eyes glued at Arya. She was so charming. She ignored him right away. Eligoni had reached a state that could not allow him to conceal his love for Arya. The announcer remain, reminded him of the match. He moved to the table and showed respect to Cardinal, then took his hand. The bell went. Elgon started smiling. He looked at Bishop, then he turned to his mom. Cardinal pushed Elgon's hand slowly as veins showed on their arms. It was great a match of total sweating. Cardinal took Elgon steadily as the crowd celebrated. Elgon was still smiling with his mom and until she realized that Cardinal had weakened and signaled to him to do it. Elgon pressed Cardinal's fingers so hard that Cardinal felt pliers chopping them off. He took, he took him bit by bit to the table and kept it there for a full minute until Cardinal gave up and pushed the table. The monkey had given away the title carelessly to the monster. Bishop picked it 
and took it to Zabu. The crowds were as silent as he walked to meet his mom and no friends. Other games continued as the girls contested. The dancing competition went ahead. Girls performed very well. They would they wound their waists nicely. People enjoyed. It was difficult to choose the best, however, the judges were available to do the needful. A spectacular dancer had painted her face with a with an arrow sign. She won the title of the Queen Dancer. The crowds asked her to reveal the face as a tough woman moved to the arena with a white handkerchief. The West had taken yet another title. It was Marie Moroto, the new Saza Queen. What a surprise! No one could ever imagine that Marie knew all the dances of the land. There was no one opposing. The day took a break as the judges and elders went for lunch. The invited guests got their meals from there. The rest sloped to the nearby home from where they made a, they made a cues and took their food. It was terrible down there as villagers ate their stomachs full. Some were already drunk by noon. Right, it did not take long for the bell to sound. Body games kicked off. Checkers took course as Kana beat Amot, my, my girl's son. Angel defeated Bishop in draft as Elgon won the chess competition. Bishop won the card game. Then Cardinal won the weightlifting title. They went to the most important spot in the land. It was between the defending champion and king dancer. Angel and Cardinal walked to the arena as cheers covered the ground. It was the general title. The two had unfinished business. They began by boxing each other. As Cardinal hit Angel on the head, Angel boxed him around the neck. When one boxed, Angel boxed Cardinal around the neck, which was a four, they moved to kickboxing, to which Angel earned more points. The last phase involved wrestling each other, and if the chest touched the ground, a winner was declared. They wrestled as supporters, including judges, stood up. It put everyone on tension. When Angel discovered that he could not defeat Cardinal, he beat him around the back severely until Cardinal lowered his chest to the ground. There was no time for complaining since Arya lifted the trophy and offered it to Angel. He had won his second title. He aimed at taking the third one. The ring was removed. Then the entire ground cleared. Shooters took their positions one by one. There was an arrangement of 100, 200, 300, and 350 feet. No one in the hills had ever shot an arrow at the last point. The best had made it to the post of 300 feet post. The unequaled in the archery elder ally demonstrated by shooting at the second last post. The arena caught fire. Cardinal yearned for the second title. He wanted to defend this. He took his first shot at that hit the first board, then the second, sh the second, and the third. He did not try the last one, for he could not manage. The spectators drummed louder. He felt lifted and took the last one. It went astray. Kana and Bishop did the same as the handsome warrior stepped forward. He did like Cardinal. 
It was Elgoni's turn. He ran to his mother for blessings, then told the bishop that he was going to write his history using an arrow. He stole a glimpse at Arya, who turned down, then to Marie. He forgot that Maudi was praying for him. He took the first arrow that broke and passed through the middle of the board. The crowd is kept quiet at once. As Maudi walked to cheer the board, to check the board, she lifted it and showed to the elders. It was unbelievable. It had never happened since time in memorial. He shot the second one, which also entered halfway. The people could not remain in the gazette perimeters. They gathered around the boards. What they always had as stories about Elgon turned real in the middle of the arena. Elgon aimed and hit the third board in the middle. This was incredible. No one of the performers had made perfect shots like Elgon. The crowds ran to the last board and stood side by side. They had no idea that an arrow would strike one of them. Elgon had built trust in their hearts as they sang praise songs. They called him a magician and aimed and closed his eyes, then shot at the last board. The arrow successfully hit in the middle of the board, but it did not stick there for long. It had lost energy. The crowds did not wait for the judges to confirm. All ran towards him like a swarm of bees.